Hello. I'm just gonna start streaming. Um. Oh. I'm gonna mute the preview, which turned itself back on very rudely. Um. Welcome to another session of Magical Girl anime tabletop RPG stuff design or whatever. Um, I've moved on to the Outsider playbook, um, having spent a bunch of time on the um, crew playbook, or crew sheet, whatever you want to call it. Um, I am, <laughs> before I started streaming, I was just trying to rethink what to put in this spot. Because initially it's been endure, but that just feels like way too, way too passive of a thing. I'm not happy with it. I want to come up with something different. I'm actually really into perceive, um, or at least the idea of perceive. And it's still girl by moonlight. Boom, girl by moonlight. That's the game. I'm making it. It's a hack of Blades in the Dark, which is an actual game that exists and is good. Um, so I'm trying to figure out a few outsider things today. Um, been working on some core moves, been working on um, their gather info questions, their darkest self type of deal, and their XP triggers are, XP triggers are still totally open-ended. So we don't know what they're going to address a challenge with. Um, and then, yeah, the rest of them change. So the rest of them don't change. So we've got a couple blank spots to fill. Darkest Self, XP triggers that are specific to this playbook. Um, one more gather info question, maybe a move or two. And then, you know, something for what used to be endure but never will be again i mean the thing about anything to do with being like like endure is fundamentally flawed because you can't actively do it you know in a vacuum or in any context i can't say like that i set out to endure something it just doesn't make sense in the same way that like I can confess something, right? Like it, I can do it without any external inputs. Um, I can just like have a feeling that I need to go confess to someone. And I mean, we can talk about how I would never have that feeling if they hadn't blah, 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 whatever. That's not the point. The point is if when I say that I'm going to go confess something to some, you know, it, there's a clear to someone, it kind of makes, it evokes a whole path to action, whereas I'm going to endure something. One, feels very passive, and two, we already have resist rolls for that, right? So like we roll, we roll any of these categories as a resistance to stuff. So it doesn't make sense to have a stat for that. I mean, I could change it so that there's a stat for that, and you don't roll the you don't we don't do the resistances thing. But in which case, I get rid of categories altogether. And it's a pretty, pretty big drift, and it's not one that I like. I like the idea of having different categories of resistances. Um, and like a lot, that's a pretty core structural element of the game that a lot of other stuff is contingent on, so I don't want to, I don't want to fully gut that, because I think it's bad to do so. Um, so, I'll just start with reading out the moves I already have. So. This is just something that you always get, which is that you choose another player character, they are your rival. You always have exactly one rival. You put their name here. Boom. And so, most of this character's core stuff is gonna be around interacting with that. Um, I don't want every move to involve it, but the first three that I wrote all involve it. Um, so you have special armor against any consequence of your rival's actions. 
and you can spend your special armor to act before your rival does. Hyena, Sean, in order for us to be rivals, you have to be important. But I won't even notice you. I am the senpai who does not notice you. But actually, the great thing about that move is that it doesn't matter if I notice you or not, I can still be your rival. And I think those kinds of like hyper-asymmetric rivalries are the best, where one character is like completely oblivious to it, and the other is like seething, like has, has all these feelings. Um, I really like those kinds of rivalries, where, where the person who is your rival is just like, who? Who are you? <laughs> we, have a, we have a thing going on? I always think those are fun. Um, and so, yeah, we have this simple move. Our special armor is about stuff that comes out of what our rival does, which can mean, like, your rival screws up and you go in to, like, help them. This could That would still be a consequence of your rival's actions. So it doesn't have to be... It's not totally about op being oppositional, exactly. It's just about this, like, partnership that is antagonistic in its... Uh, color in its character but not in its function um, in case it's not clear Sean's the best and I love Sean very dearly um, I'm sorry for using you in my example so cruelly you deserve better still didn't kill all your characters though um, move two so you gain slash grant an extra die when participating in or leading group actions with your rival and each suffer one additional stress if either of you fail um so group actions in blades um one character leads everyone else rolls as well um and then the leader takes stress for everyone who fails and then you like succeed or fail as a as a group so if one person gets a six then boom that's that's your result um, and there are there's like the move that shadows get where they can count sixes from different people in group actions to get a crit stuff like that um, <laughs> yes yes Alex just like that um, so that's your your group action and then the way that we are going to color it with this move is that if I'm either leading or following my rival um, I either get an extra die when I'm leading them or I give an extra die to them when I'm leading when they're leading me or I'm helping them I think it's going to include help um, but then we each suffer one additional stress if either of us fail so right, it's like everything is super loaded between these two characters uh, and they can work well together but as soon as things start falling apart it's damaging to both of them it's kind of the idea um, it's just that whole thing where the relationship becomes very high stakes unnecessarily because of or like the action that they're undertaking becomes higher stakes just because they're involved in it because they have this antagonistic relationship um and then when you gather information you can always ask where is my rival and what are they doing for free um, if your rival is about to die or fall to darkness you can choose to be there and resist those consequences um so the idea here being of course that like no one can kill you I have to kill you that whole thing right like you can't allow your rival to be beaten by someone else because then you won't get to beat them um, so these are some kind of rough moves that I came up with I'm really happy with the first one the special armor rule I think is really good um, I think it's a neat notion that we get like the lightning reflexes move from blades but in a on a very conditional kind of one use way so like that one time that it matters if you need to act before your rival does you get you can spend your special armor to have that um, I think is cool and then this kind of externalized uh, protection thing I find interesting as well um, that like you can swing in and help for someone else um, and get you're better at it because you have special armor for it. Um, and I think we're going to run it, that special armor in my game is like the mega resist. Um, so whereas regular resists of like harm or whatever bump it down by one. So if you take level three harm, you only take level two harm. With special armor, I think it's just going to be like, boom, there's no harm. I, 
think that would be nice to make this to make this strong and appealing as a move. Um, and generally, I don't want to make all the moves like about making you stronger exactly, as much as I want them to like give you options. Um, because this isn't a game about making like super powerful characters, in my opinion, at this point. That's how I'm feeling about it. So those are the moves I have. Um, for gather info, there's where is my rival and what are they doing, right? This is one that we get for free if we have the move. Otherwise, we need to ask uh, or spend one of our like options or one of our questions to ask. And then how can I gain an edge over my rival? Uh, where's the danger here that no one else sees and what's really going on here? I like so what's really going on here is shared by the guardian in this playbook But I like these two as representing the rival being this like really exacting hard-assed like intense person who understands the bad shit more than the other characters do um, and so whereas the guardian is trying to protect people from it the outsider would be more in the position of being like exasperated by everyone else not getting it just being like oh of course of course they're going to attack us from ambush like over here like i used to you know be one of the baddies and so i know how they work or whatever else so we get we get some questions like this that are informed uh based on that still trying to figure out one last one we've got two rival focused ones this is as much as i want to commit to rivals um it might be another like knowing that i think this needs to be something to do with being edgy and dark. So some kind of dark, edgy question. Yeah, I, I like what I like about this one is that it, you know, it, it suggests the idea that this character is able to like, like that everyone's going to see danger in a dangerous situation like not everyone it's not like everyone's stupid <laughs> um but that this character sees like one level deeper um into into that kind of space than the other characters do uh for whatever reason all right well i'm going to bounce down here to xp triggers so with the guardian, we wanted to encourage teamwork and like protecting other people or something. Let me just, I have the playbook available. Teamwork or self-sacrifice, right? That's the thing. You're, you know, you're the bodyguard. You're taking the bullets for people. Um, whereas with this playbook, you're trying to like be, <laughs> it's like, you're not the protagonist, but you kind of want to be, or like, you know, you're not the best, but you're always trying to, like, prove yourself. Um, oh, yeah, I like this, like, who else is an edgelord like me kind of vibe that you're suggesting in Games from the Wildwood. I think that's good. Um, so I think, like, address the challenge with brute force or, like, direct force. Because ultimately, I want this to be a really, like, straightforward and aggressive kind of approach to problem solving. So, like, and, and like, a little bit darker than the other playbooks. Oh, and bravado. I like, I like having bravado be in there. Yeah. Um, because then, here's the thing as well. Like, our high stats are perceive and express. Um, so like this is the one to imply that we have like a better understanding of what's going on like we see clearly because we're not like ironically because we're not as innocent a playbook as the other ones um, and then express because we're always calling people idiot and stuff yeah direct confrontation is probably more appropriate I mean it's addressed a challenge, so of course it involves confrontation. So it's like addressed a challenge directly, or hmm, 
the wording on this one is the real trick, right? Like, <laughs> not like I wanted to help you, Baka. Well, someone's car is getting towed. It's too bad for them. <laughs> it's like <laughs> unflinching bravado. I mean. It has to be a way that you do thing, like, it has to be an approach and not a, like, and not just color, if that makes sense. So it's like, it's beyond just being like, I'm doing this thing and I'm acting really proud while doing it, or I'm like talking a bunch of shit while doing it, because that's not really what it's about. It's about, um, here's it with individual individual action or and that I think covers our like bravado category right of just like you went and you did it on your own right and that's really about proving that you can do something on your own um, and that keeps it pretty open like I don't want to like super constrain them but I like the idea you know because we're the outsider we have to do things alone um, and that doesn't mean that we have to go like super hard into the rival thing. Um, yeah, so by like with independent action, yeah, it's better than individual. Independent. No, it's not in dip, it's independent spelling. with independent action or violence. We could just make this the violent one. Um, I don't want to super encourage tons of violence, but I kind of do. I mean, it does feel broad, but like, if we frame it as being independent, that's different from individual action, I feel. I feel like this says a lot about how, like, if you go off and do something on your own, then that's independent action. Because, like, everyone's going to be rolling the dice. It's not like every roll in the game is going to be a, a team roll. But this is like your character went and acted independently of the group, um, like pursuing their own goals or something like that, um, which will also reflect in your blue stress roll, etc. Jeez, my spelling is just getting ripped apart by the chat. Thank you very much. With violence or violins. Um, whenever you play the violin. Yeah, I think I just want to put violence in here. I think we're just going to do it. Hilariously, we do not have points in Defy, which is the most direct fighty thing. But we can definitely shout at people because we have Express. All right, let's talk about let's talk about darkness. I think aggression instead of violence is a yeah. I actually I agree with that. I agree with that. Games from the Wildwood. I think that's a smart way to do it. Because then aggression can be like social aggression. Competitiveness. I feel like aggression gets us there in the same in the same way of doing like competitiveness, Matthias Belger. Um, but I think all of these are in the same like ballpark. Um, and yeah, I like the switch from violence to aggression because I want it to include to more like clearly include social violence, violence like shouting at people, um, which let's be real is all violence. And yeah, like competing with your rival is something you're going to be doing while you're doing that, or like a reason why you might pursue engaging. But it doesn't, right, in this very like blades way, right? This is about like operating the way that you are expected to uh, based on your playbook. So, like for the lurk, it's with stealth or evasion, right? Like that is what this one needs to be. It's a very, it's very much about like action roles and stuff, um, and we might revisit 
what our high scores are here to make it support this better. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that XP trigger. So let's talk about the darkest self kind of thing here. So for the Guardian, um, and I want to keep this formatting pretty consistent, we have like a colorful like roleplay prompt and then how you escape it. And then that's it. That's as much as it needs to be. Um, all the ones in Monster Hearts are very short, really. Um, they're not overly involved. They aren't especially mechanistic. They're pretty flavorful, right? Like, darkest self for the mortal. Nobody understands you or even wants to. They'd rather have you disappear. Or sorry, they'd rather you disappear. Well, you're not going to disappear. You're going to make like a living hell for them. You'll betray the wicked to the judges, the weak to the executioners. You'll pit humans and supernaturals against one another until everyone looks like monsters. Right? There's our prompt. This is basically like, here's how you need to act. And then only seeing the pain that, you're ca that you are causing your lover will let you escape your darkest self. Boom. Easy. The escape clause needs to be pretty direct and short. Uh, clear language, right? Because this is the, it's the most mechanistic portion of the, like, move, we can call this. Um, because that's how we get out. And that's, like, that's that's a contract, right? Where we're saying, I agree to be my darkest self, provided that I can escape, and here's how I escape. And everyone needs to be able to look at that and evaluate clearly, like, yeah, I feel like that fits. I feel like you did that thing. Um, the more vague and hand wavy it is, the easier it is to weasel out of your darkest self, uh, or at the very least, the easier it is for your table to have ambiguity and conflict around that topic, uh, which we want to avoid. We want everything to be clear because there's rules. Um, and so, right, we, we've got this now for the Guardian, which is the other playbook that we have most, not, I won't say finished, but like, I put at least a rough together. All the people you have sworn to protect are unworthy of that protection. You belong at the front, leading the fight. Wherever foes exist, you seek them out and confront them directly, right now. You can only escape your darkest self when someone shows you how you are vulnerable and loves you despite your own weakness. Um... That one I wasn't, I wasn't quite 100% on, but basically the idea is um, we give this fictional trigger, um, we want it to involve the other characters, um, which you know is true in Monster Hearts as well, um, and we want it to like signal some kind of character growth. Even if we don't codify that very specifically, um, you know, like, I don't say in this, I don't list this objective, which is what this, this is a note to myself down here at the bottom. Get the Guardian to be cool with vulnerability in general. Um, this is my goal, right, is to have them go through that arc of being like, yeah, being vulnerable is the worst, right? Like, everyone's unworthy of my protection. They're all crap. I should be in charge of fighting, and we should fight all the time, and blah, blah, blah. Let's go do it right now. And then you can only escape when someone shows you how you are vulnerable and loves you despite your own weakness, right? So it's like the accepting portion and the vulnerability portion showing how you are vulnerable. Uh, someone else has to do this for you. Um, and this arc goes from like selfish, shitty teenager to a teenager maybe learning a lesson but then you, you basically go back to being the regular default selfish shitty teenager mode, and then you'll eventually fall back into this again. Um, I mean, we're not monsters as we would be in Monster Hearts, so we we swing more wildly from like, yeah, we're friends, to uh, everything's terrible, and then back again. Um, but we also have more impetus to do so. I think it'll all work. Okay, Guardian, so there's a TED Talk I want you to listen to. Yeah, kind of. I mean, something less trite, hopefully. Um, so there's like an emotional arc that we want to inspire with these moves, right? And that's what's going to make playing them, playing into them satisfying. 
um, because it'll be we want ideally for this clause to reflect essentially tension that should already be at the table based on what the characters are good at and what their moves push them to to be right like oh i'm always protecting all these other characters and like why do i bother doing that blah 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 um and that therefore we when we offer this prompt of like oh these people you're protecting they're not worthy of it etc this feels natural for the person's character that they have made which i can never understand completely i can only hope to get at and i hope that the moves and whatnot that i provided shape the experience such that this makes sense to them if i've hit that then great we also know how we want to get out of it and that this the transition from one to the other to the other right from like the original version to the darkest self to then the the me that is turning back from my darkest self and into a regular person um hopefully that will become meaningful and make some cool moments right that's what we're hoping for with these moves um so this is the one for the guardian um now we've got the outsider right very different so Hey Kira, welcome. Uh, so with the outsider, the kind of general stuff that we want them to be doing is providing a like slightly darker counterpoint um, to the rest of the crew, um, because these this character, we expect them to have been like, you know an agent of the darkness like they maybe were one of the baddies at one point and they've switched over to our team like a like a peridot or um, you know choose as you will examples from fiction uh or the you know dark-haired girl in madoka who's like i'm on the same side as you but i'm like intense and you don't understand me and you know i have a backstory and you don't want to hear it but it's been dark and edgy and i'm i'm real edgy um and then the other characters are like, oh, they're so edgy. I want to understand them. I hope that they're a human being on the inside. Um, yeah, Hyena, I think, is pretty much nailing it with this idea of trying to belong was a mistake. They're laughing at you. You should never left. Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, about, yeah, like a return to the embrace of the edgy darkness or um, a falling to it because being one of the good guys has is like holding you back in a way right like this is another one of those like all these things that are supposedly virtuous like friendship and blah blah those are just holding you back you're actually all the strength you need is blah 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 edge 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 that's the kind of thing we want to push towards and then how we bring them back out of it that one's a little more complicated i don't and also i don't want this to just be exactly what the guardian one was right which was just like basically yeah you're the best be selfish being selfish is cool go fight things um i kind of want to take a little bit of a different spin than what some of y'all are posting in chat which like i think is a pretty good straight up um thing um which is that rather than be like these people all suck you need to be the darkest dark that ever darked i kind of want to push it in the direction of like all these people suck you should just go solve their problems for them like you only you understand what the darkness really is and how to how to like destroy it and that you should just like go and, and fight the thing alone um and have it be this kind of like messiah complex thing of like i have to or like martyr complex rather where it's like i have to go and like take all this burden onto myself like that all of these innocent little magical girls you know that they can't handle it um and that only only you the lord of edges can handle it um i feel like that's a really neat direction to take it um because that one I think encompasses the two ideas that i'm holding with this about like the rival thing right of like 
antagonistic relationship with another character, right? Because then you're like, yeah, no, they suck. They're garbage. Why am I even wasting time trying to be better than them or trying to, like, prove that I'm better than them? I'm going to just go, like, accomplish stuff on my own and not tether myself to this bullshit. Uh, and then the other one, which is the, like, I am the edgiest of edges. Only I understand the darkness. Only I can face it. Uh, others need to be spared facing it. Um, and having a little bit of that, like, you know, I'm, I'm already dead. My, you know, my soul is the darkness, etc. Um, so let me just, like, note form this to myself, and then we can write some evocative, edgy fiction. So, basically, uh, others are too innocent and must be spared the darkness. The darkness is nastiness. Um, why am I wasting time trying to prove anything? And of course, the great irony of this statement is that they're going to go and do the biggest cry for help imaginable, which is go, like, suicidally sacrifice themselves. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a bit of, like... Not quite nihilism, Alex, but like a, a, a bid for oblivion, if you will. Right? And then Games from the Wildwood has it, right? That the, the interesting thing is not, oh, your rival's actually better than you and you have to like keep competing with them. I'm like, no, who cares? That's bullshit. That's not a, an interesting arc for our character. What it is instead is like, yo, you are worth saving as well. Like, don't throw your life away. Uh, that whole arc, I think, is, is more compelling. Um, we get out when someone shows us that we are worth saving too. Right, this is the, like, the real edgelord arc of, like, only I can face the darkness, and it's like, and, you know, I'm... I'm a lost soul, I'm too edgy. And then people are like, no, actually, you're not all edges, you have some fluffy bits. Yeah, it's fatalistic. It would be a good word for it, Alex. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I like that as a little arc. Because that feels more... Like, if this were Monster Hearts, just go, go deep into the whole, like, do it like the vampire one, where it's just like when someone better than you puts you in your place because you're not actually that powerful um i should really know that darkest self by heart at this point because my the fucking vampire in my monster Hearts game is just like forever going into their darkest self it's like their favorite thing to do and it's all because everything they do goes horribly wrong um let me just let me just find it because it's a good one no i'm too early in the alphabet Gotta go to the bees here. The vampire, darkest self. Everyone is your pawn, your plaything. You hurt them and make them vulnerable for sport, like a cat does with a mouse. You feed to the point of death whenever you're alone with someone, though you take your time. You escape your darkest self when put in your rightful place by someone more powerful than you, right? Like, that would be if I were really to commit to this whole rival thing and take it to its ultimate conclusion in, and keep the game in a really antagonistic tone but that's not what we want right we want the redemptive like the antagonism is only interesting because it's about this like wrestling towards ultimately getting along and being awesome together um and yeah this whole like angle of fatalism i think is a really interesting one to make some moves about as well um Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like, maybe this is the playbook. I mean, okay, yeah. This is the playbook that has Daredevil. When you make a desperate roll, gain an extra die. Right? Like, that lines up perfectly with this whole fatalism thing. Um... And so even in the midst of our, you know, spiral, 
we might actually be be really badass for a bit and then like things totally go to shit um and yeah i games from the wildwood is is making good comments tonight right this whole idea of like this comment your innocence is worth protecting right which which says so much more than it's just saying right because it's like oh well, no you're not even though you were part of the like baddies and all this other shit like you still have some innocence in you that we need to protect i think is a really neat idea yeah all right let's write this so um i'm having the opener the opening line this is very tricky i need to like go shop at hot topic for a bit and then come back and write this um Oh, right, and minus one die to resist the consequences of that action. Very important. Minus one to resist the consequences of desperate actions. Uh, no, Kira, I think that's that's really solid. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna like totally rip you off. So Kira writes, I am tainted by all that I have done and all that I know. I think it's a great opening line. The only way to redeem myself is to sacrifice myself for the greater good. Okay, so I actually, I need to, there's some like style difference because I want this to be in the second person as being like addressed to you, the reader. Um, English is an awkward language because like I want to write it like this all that you have done and know but that's not that's not what you can do and all that you know um, writing is hard this is not necessarily my strong suit so you are tainted by all that you have done and all that you know I'm gonna rewrite this again so you know you have seen too much of the darkness it's left it's not on you. writing is hard so the thing I want to say is this idea of like you need to go destroy the darkness and you are part of the darkness so you have to also destroy yourself but I want to round that into a nice sentence You must make the edgy dark choices so that other people don't have to. Yes, exactly. That's what we want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, 
Wildwood says here, they they don't deserve to be good after seeing doing so much bad, right? Like that they don't believe in their own in the possibility of their own redemption. Um, So you have seen too much of the darkness, and there is no hope for redemption. You need to destroy it. But it's inside you. Yeah, uh, it's like, I was having the same difficulty writing the previous one, where it's just like, writing rules like this one, where it's doing double duty of like, mechanics and being, trying to be evocative, right? It's difficult, you have to, it's very, it's very dense writing, um, so it's lots of like, agonizing over word choice and stuff like that. If I was a more practiced writer, I'm sure I could just bang this crap out, but... Uh, I'm having difficulty expressing all of these things at once in a clean way. Mmm, Alex with the, with the excellent editing is that it is better all that you know and all that you have done, right? The idea that in a list we we go from the least important thing to the most important thing, or that there's like a an, an arc, right? An upward swing. I think it's really good. And yeah, cross Dave. That's that's yeah. That's really what I'm trying to get at, right? Of this idea of like taking the darkness down with you. Mm, and maybe that's the language we want to use, even because that's a. It's like kind of a cliche, but it but it could be a useful one to to express this whole concept because we want to play to type on it. Yeah, and like. I don't know, this is reminding me of a lot of like suicide note type rhetoric, right? Of like, you know, needing to do this super extreme thing um, and feeling like there's no other option and like you're not worth, you know, a worthwhile person and all that kind of stuff. Um, which is heavy, it's very heavy. Um, and although this is not something I have like direct personal experience with in terms of like I have never been in that place a lot of my friends when I was in high school went there um, yeah so this is, is real dark Okay, so, so far I, I do like what we have written here, right? You have seen too much of the darkness and there is no hope for redemption. Good first sentence, it establishes some stuff, um, right? And like we have to look at this beyond just being about when you're in your dark self. This also informs the whole playbook, right? Like this is something that is, you know, held to be true about the character. This is where they where they go when things get dark. Um, so, you have seen too much of the darkness and there is no hope for redemption. You are tainted by all that you know and all that you have done. So here's where we get into the like the fatalism aspect of it, right? Where we want to say the only way to
to destroy the darkness. Especially that which is inside you. Yeah, and like, Staves, that is a, like both a morbid and really interesting thing. Like, I, I imagine something like that exists of just like an internet archive of suicide notes. God, that would be grim. That would be super intense reading. Um, but also, like, very fascinating. This is a, an interesting aspect of the human experience and of human psychology, right? That, like, we can rationalize our own termination. Um, is pretty messed up. There are bugs in my room. Get out of here, bugs. Well, so I don't agree with putting redemption anywhere else in here because, of course, we have already decided there is no hope for redemption. It is not possible, according to this character's internal monologue, which we want to be consistent with um, because this is a prompt for our lovely players down the line. Um... So even this idea of fixing it, maybe I need to rethink. I don't like this sentence at the very least. So the only good you can do is to drag is to you know it's like oh you want you want to drag it to hell with you kind of a thing This is where I want to get all like melodramatic and be like, so far down that it can never return. This all feels very melodramatic to me. What I missed from this one that I enjoyed in the Guardian one right was this like clear action thing right wherever foes exist you seek them out and confront them directly right now it needs a sentence the darkest self needs a sentence like this which is just like go do this thing right here here's the why like ah we have all these feelings great here's what you fucking do do this thing So I just need to make it imperative. And I mean, yeah, I, like, I just need to kind of embrace melodrama a little more, I think, is a fair point. Uh, but if I'm going to go kicking and screaming into that one. I really don't like melodrama. Um, You have to banish the darkness from the world now, alone, before others are tainted like you. That's what I'm going to go with for now. I'm not terribly happy with this, but uh, whatever.
So we get out when someone shows us that we are worth saving too. So you escape your darkest self when, and let's review our guardian one, right? You can only escape your darkest self when someone shows you how you are vulnerable and loves you despite your own weakness. Easy. So you can only escape your darkest self when. Uh, cross staves, what triggers uh, darkness? I think I might, I'm gonna change the name of it. It's something unique to my game, but anyways. Uh, the way this happens is when we get to maximum stress, uh, we don't have trauma in this game um, because that's not really fitting with the themes of the game. So instead, uh, when you're in this last stress pip, every time you take... So it's when you hit it and then every time you take stress thereafter, you make a roll. Um, and if you fail the roll, you're out for the remainder of the session and you become your darkest self and you keep or sorry you're out for the remainder of like that like fight or whatever um you know what actually no sorry you're not out i don't think i want to make us be out you go into this state where you're your darkest self um i think i then want to do a thing where you like spend your stress down to do stuff but if you zero out then you're totally screwed so essentially we fill our we fill our stress counter all the way up. We hit this like precipice where we're rolling every time we take stress. We're rolling, we're rolling, we're rolling. And then when we fail, the stress track inverts and becomes like hit points. We spend them, we can keep doing stuff. We have this other agenda that we're operating with. And then if it if it zeroes out, then we're just kaput. The character is dead. Um, they have like fully succumbed to the darkness. You hand them over to the, you hand over your sheet to the MC. Uh, your character is part of is one of the baddies, uh, you know, forever irredeemably. It's over. Anytime before that, your friends can purify you, help you out. You escape your darkest self. Things are all good. Um, we might allow for when you totally bottom out that the crew can go on a. Uh, let's see, what's it called? Cleanse a person or location uh, mission and get you back, but you're like off the squad. You become your like shadow self, yeah. Um, and then the other option, of course, is when you hit this point um, and you're making that roll that if you fail, you go darkest self. If you crit it, you get to be a super badass. Um, which I'm just, this is just me straight up stealing from Darkest Dungeon, because I think that's a really fun mechanic. Uh, the whole idea of the, like, breakpoint with stress, and then you can, like, go heroic very rarely. Most of the time you just go bad, um, or that you, like, hang out on that precipice, I think is really fun. Neat. Uh, it gives us, you know some outlets other than the whole like trauma thing of blades it changes the flavor of the game a fair bit um and that the way that we're more likely to die i think usually by that happening than by taking harm um and also like in the source material there's totally that kind of shit that goes on where like at the last possible fucking moment you know one of the characters like gets their shit together and does this super heroic thing um when all the chips are down right um and it's fun to have the potential within your game for those really like crazy big swings to happen um, in the mechanics and the dice. I feel I feel like those are fun. Um, they allow for moments to come up. Like I was watching Adam's office hours thing uh, about making memorable moments. It was one of those this question that was put to him, um, and he was like, "You don't make them." but they do happen and certain games are more likely to make them happen. I feel like Darkest Dungeon for me makes those happen uh, where like I, I did one of the like Darkest Dungeon missions, like the, the big like final uh, area that you go to where the missions are super ridiculously hard. Holy shit. Uh, and my run where I beat the first one, everyone but one guy died 
and the one guy who was alive hit his had hit his breakpoint and gone virtuous. He was a leper, and he went virtuous, and then just like single handedly wrecked the final boss because it was like in the last fight, of course, um, the last fight of like the first Darkest Dungeon series because you could do there are like five or six that you do, and yeah, like he he beat the mission. He was like the most heroic guy. And, you know, he sticks around after that, and it's fucking awesome. That was, like, a really cool thing. And I, I remember that happening because it was it was this, like, convergence of all of the mechanics of the game interacting in this interesting way. It just happened that the right guy at the right time got the right role to then go into, like... It was, like, the virtue that he ended up in was the particular one that made it work as well. And then he happened to be the leper and who was thus able to do it and, like boom you know that thing i i fucking remember that i'm not gonna forget that thing that happened because it was very unlikely and very like emotionally loaded and was about this like you know it was in a very high stakes situation all those factors worked together to make this to make that a memorable thing that happened to me um so i think to have the system push for that stuff it has to be consequential uh high stakes and have the possibility within one like role for there to be this big divergence of like a really good result a really bad result um that there can be this like dramatic thing that happens um and yeah like people are talking about like could would one of the classes have a higher chance of critting that role or something or like get more dice for making that role yeah, totally. Why not? Right? Like, I think that would be interesting. Right? Like, Hyena Spots is saying, so in our in our Blades game, uh, Sean's character had this whole, like, he had this crazy flashback that he did where it was, like, to use a friend of his to betray the person that they were doing the score for, like, the person who hired them to do the score. Um... And his character, Birch, like, had this mixed history with that person and didn't like them. And so it was this whole thing of, like, yeah, I'm going to, like, set this guy up for betrayal. And it was, like, a couple little flashbacks. And, of course, it, like, came down to one role and Sean biffed the role. And then that resulted in his character going to prison forever, right? Like, but there was that, there was that moment where everything converged. And that, and, you know, all eyes are on that action in that moment. And so, kind of regardless of what the outcome is, as long as it's dramatic, uh, that makes that moment shine, right? Like, it can be that that character dies, or it can be that that character succeeds in that moment against all odds, and this really cool thing happens. Both are equally memorable. Um, endings and beginnings, very memorable. Um, or, like, you know, and, like, a turning point like that is kind of a, a beginning, uh, is how I look at it. So, in that extended metaphor. Anyways... My point is that I think having these kinds of mechanics um, will be really fun and give us as players like cool shit to look back on when we play these games and like cool moments. Um, and yeah, like if you're gonna have random dice rolls, they should be interesting. They should be impactful. They should create cool situations or lead you out of stuff in interesting ways. Um, I don't want anyone to be rolling dice in this game and have it just be like, yeah, whatever, I'm just going to roll some dice. Um, and I think, like, Blades, Vanilla Blades does a great job of making, you know, dice rolls matter a lot. And that's by, that's not by having it be that you get a lot out of them. Most of the time, you don't, your outcomes, if they're successful, are kind of humble and, and less interesting in a lot of ways. Um, the ones that stand out are the crits, where you get more than you expected, right, which are very rare, and then the the failures. The failures, which happen quite a bit more often, are super interesting. So, I'm trying to have my game play into that, that kind of, like, dramatic dice mechanic that I'm that I am adopting from Blades and I'm trying to think of other ways interesting ways to ratchet that up 
coming full circle to what the fuck we were talking about in the first place, um, we get out when someone shows us that we are worth saving too. So you can only escape your darkest self when... Oh my gosh. You can only escape your darkest self when... Should this be like someone shows you that you too are innocent and worthy of saving? entirely sold on this one. You can only escape your darkest self when someone shows you that you too are innocent and worth saving. It's like, it's not very clear, right? Like, all this doesn't feel very clear at all. What does this really mean? It's not specific enough. Let's review our primary sources. What are some good ones? Okay, now, obvious one, when your rival, or like, obviously your rival has to be the one to redeem you, holy crap. Um. And then a secondary clause on this is you must choose a new rival. Right? This is an opportunity for us to make nice with our rival character. Um, and I think it's as good a spot as any to tell the player, like, hey, now is the time for you to resolve your bickering with this player or with this character. Um, make that happen. Um, right, and so now we can have these two characters who are fighting a bunch, get that catharsis of like, hey, now we're friends. We like find this common ground. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for sticking around, Alex. I know it's really late for you, so I appreciate you hanging out. Um, but you know, if it's like five in the morning now, it's time to go. Uh, yeah, I think this is a good, good one to point to pull in the whole rival thing. So your rival has to be the one to redeem you. Mm, what does that look like? Where a character who normally does independent action and who is very like aggression oriented, I like the idea of yeah having like a softer side or like an a, an element of innocence in the character. Um, blah, it's difficult, very difficult, because it's a pretty ambiguous notion. Like, I can, I can explain it if I use lots of long words, but, like, summing it up in a really short and sweet way. Like, this is a nice little one, too, that we have for the Guardian, right? Someone shows you how you are vulnerable, right? So that essentially means there's, like, an impassioned melodramatic speech from one of the other characters uh, that ends in, and I care about you a lot, um, right? And this is about, like, friendship and a reversal of the established kind of order of relationships, which is important because we want to have these moments be, like, a revelation moment, right? So, so this is about, like, it's kind of about common ground, too, then, right? Like, commonality between rival and you is important to this, I feel like. 
Um, because with the whole like rivalry thing, it's all about differences. Um, but there's the unstated fact that like you two must be similar enough that you're competing, right? That you're in the same category. Um, so maybe it's about about showing that. When you see how you and your rival, you know, it's like we're not so different. We're not so different. But that's not impactful enough. This is kind of what I want to get at. Yeah, exactly, Cross Dave. The, we're not so different, you and I. I'm trying to think of examples of this from like the you know the core fiction that we're basing this on. Yeah, maybe Takuru's got the right idea, right? To like rather than have it be, oh, we're all innocent and beautiful, have the other characters who whom the outsider has elevated right to this status of being like perfect innocent angelic you know do-gooders to show that like they also have these dark feelings and stuff like that that it's about i mean it's about establishing a rapport right like that is consistent with what i said earlier but yeah that it's a rapport formed on shared like the shared darker side of things rather than this like sunshine and lollipops thing because i think that's a much more plausible outcome right like this is more realistic based on the human experience that like people are people generally are sad and suffer a lot yeah and that and that those two you know decoupling the idea that oh just because you have this darkness in you doesn't mean that and then you know the next week they'll fall to the darkness again and we'll go through this whole song and dance and they'll pick a new rival but um yeah i like that but how do we write this <laughs> uh When you see that you both have a darker side, basically, when you s And yeah, ultimately this is about being accepted by your rival, right? When blah, 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 and then Darkest self when your rival blah 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 and accepts you. You must choose a new rival. And yeah, Matthias, that's totally the talk, right? Of like, yeah, I, I feel that too. But like, you're still red, we're still friends, we're all a team, let's go be cool together. Um Yeah, I feel like that's a good thing to do. Um, and it's like, it's funny because we were talking about this, but like, talking about Darkest Cells, I then bounced back and like totally answered a bunch of questions I had about the like, the stress loop and how that all plays out and how we want to do Darkest Cells in general and what we want all the mechanics around it to be, um, which was rad and awesome and super helpful. Uh, and it's funny where inspiration catches you, where it comes from. Mm, yeah, maybe it's beyond accepting and it's like, and you two accomplish something together.
so. When you see that your rival has their own demons they struggle with, and you two accomplish something together. Despite your differences, you must choose a new rival. Let's do something like this. Reasonable enough for now. It'll do. I mean, yeah, Hyena Spots, this is a magical girl anime. Everyone needs to hug each other all the time, but they can't because they don't have enough points in Confess or Express. So they can't do it. All they can do is, like, feel a bunch of feelings about each other at a great emotional distance. And yeah, the other thing is, like, we want to keep this, some of this really general so that it can happen, um, so it doesn't have to be like, and you fight the final boss together and win, and then you get redeemed. Like, no, it can just be like, you do some basic shit together. Um, usually within the framework of, like, a mission. It's not just like, you two do a teamwork role together, but it'll be like, a mission ends where you did this stuff, or a session ends and you've done this stuff, then boom, you can snap out of it. Um, but I kind of have this idea of having a framework similar to uh, Sagas of the Icelanders, where like Sagas of the Icelanders says like a session includes this stuff. You might have to meet up and play several times to complete one session. Your one session might take you, you know, twenty hours of play. But here's what a session is. A session is a mechanical unit, and here's what all the stuff that's in it. I want to do, like, episodes, um, and then seasons. And an episode is, you know, this much stuff. And a season is this much stuff. Yes, Games from Wildwood. I was thinking something similar, um, that they have a move where they are like able to investigate better or something um, and you know all of these are these are all optional moves right so basically depending on which one I pick I'm making a statement about my character I might eventually pick all of them but by then I'll have a lot of fiction established to justify all of these things um, but if I take the one about investigating the darkness first which is going to be of the flavor of like I have I already have seen a lot of the darkness and so I like get to understand it better um the one that is like that if I pick it first I'm signaling that my character is that type of character so it's very likely as well that that will be to back up my previous statement of like oh yeah I used to like be one of the baddies and I have defected to join you guys and so I'm taking this move because that makes sense for me right Hey, Sith Master, how's it going? I got to hear your voice, Sith Master, on Adam's show. I got to hear you ask Adam a question. I thought it was a good question. Yeah, yeah, like this move is about being a former... <laughs> former henchwoman. It's not the final name. But it's a funny name. Um, X hench. Um, so here's the thing. Also, is like, we're blades, we're blades hack, which means that our, our moves, or like our special abilities, they're not really moves, they're abilities. In the in the parlance of blades, um. They don't necessarily give us like completely new mechanical things to do, um, like a new thing to roll. 
in the way that like Apocalypse World moves do. Um, let me open the Blades playbooks to kind of demonstrate my point here. So we have the Whisper. And I'm going to zoom these in. All right, so here are the Whisper's special abilities. The closest to a like full-on new thing is something like this one. So Compel, you can attune to the ghost field to force a nearby spirit to appear and obey a command you give it. You are not supernaturally terrified by a spirit you summon or compel, though your allies may be. Right? And so it's not so much like I can imagine an early state of this game where there are no special abilities at all. And a player in playtest is just like, cool, I have a tune. I want to like make a ghost appear in front of me and then like make it do stuff. And I can roll a tune for that, right, John? And John's like, uh, yeah. And then later he's like, that seems like a core enough thing that we want to give them a move about that. And then you write this in, you know? Like, I feel like because of uh, the process that John used in making the game and also how the game is structured, you end up with some stuff like this. And I think it's interesting um, that you could play it that this move doesn't exist and that anyone with a tune can just do that thing or you could not really define it and maybe people will independently come to this conclusion or you can have a move that's just like a permission and there are a bunch of moves like this in the game um which i think are really interesting because they're kind of like suggestions like compel is is basically john the game designer being like hey have you thought of using a tune this way like, here's this little prompt about it. It's a special move. Woo. But, like, you know, you could play it that just, like, anyone with a tune could do that. Um, and it's not that different from the kind of stuff you do with a tune normally. Um, but it's, like, a, a permission that your character gets to do this thing a little bit deeper, maybe. Right? Like, maybe a tune is, like, a more shallow version of the kind of stuff that you can do with Compel. Um or less specialized. But this is a, a slight variance on the core action of a tune. And then it has an extra clause of, you are not supernaturally terrified by a spirit you summon or compel. Right, which is a nice little sideline to that other thing. Um, right, and so there's this whole thing, like Sith Master is saying in chat, does this ability exclude people without it from using it? Which is like, sometimes. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, and that you see that in Apocalypse in like more direct, like classic PBTA, Powered by the Apocalypse Engine games. Um, those kinds of moves exist as well. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like some of these moves came out of playtesting and play and players having questions and players pushing the core material out like expanding the not like the setting or but like the mechanic like expanding the mechanical space of the game or or like pushing up against the limits of it um and maybe some adjudication in the sense of like oh well no i don't think you can really use a tune to like compel a ghost to do what you want that's like that's like too much you can't really do that um, but like, that should totally be a move, you know, like people asking for things and you being like, mm, I don't think that fits in the basic stuff, but like, I would like you to be able to do that, but I would like that to be special. Um, and yeah, like a bunch of the moves in the slider are similar in these like being permissions thing. And I think they're actually some of the most interesting moves in the game are some of the ones that are like strictly fictional positioning, like this one, like looking into a mirror, you can always tell when someone is lying to you. That's the move. Right? Like, it's brilliant. That's a great move. And this is just about the fiction. Um, and that's it. There's no, like, mechanics to it. It's just like, you can always turn to the GM and, <clears throat> you can always turn to the GM and be like, is this person lying to me? And they have to tell you if they are, actually are or not. And that's a move, and that's super helpful, 
It's very useful in the game. It's cool. Um, and they're they're hard to write. I spend a long time thinking about these kinds of moves. I don't come up with them very easily. They're they're like an elegant and interesting thing. Um, and I try. I have like a couple that I came up with for some of the other playbooks, but yeah, they're tough. Um, geez, we got really far off track. <laughs> Um, because we have our gather info questions as well. This is the other thing, right? Um, and so gather info, we can we can roll a bunch of different actions to accomplish anything in the game. But one of the things that we can do is gather information. And we might do that um, by perceiving. We might do that by investigating. We might do that by empathizing. Um, we could do it with express. We could like, you know, get people to spill the beans by talking to them. Um, we could punch it out of things, you know, any of these could theoretically uh, give us access to more information. And then based on our playbook that we've chosen, we get a certain set of questions, um, which is why I've included this one that I haven't detailed out yet, but I want there to be some kind of, so already we have a couple that are cued off of this, but of us being like a dark edgelord who, who gets it in a way that the more innocent characters maybe don't, right? So like, what's the danger here that no one else sees? Which is to say, you know, you're able to see something that other people don't because you are, um, because you know things about the darkness or because you're, you know, less innocent, etc. than them. This one is going to be along those lines as well. And then what's really going on here is another one of those very, like, it's like a very cynical move. Um, Yeah, there's room to make this this idea here fit in as one of the moves or whatever, but I still need a, a fair distribution of questions for them, so they're going to need a fifth question, whatever that is. Um, what do I know about the scene but can only explain by exa exasperation? Who is being a baka? Um, and to your point, Hyena, um, about just just have actions and playbook descriptions and see what kind of stuff people try to do. I think that is like a completely legitimate way to go about making this game. Um, and it is not entirely unlike what I am going to end up doing, right? Because I'm not going to, I'm not going to figure out all the moves ultimately on my first go, certainly not. Um, and so that, that, behavior is going to happen and these all are going to change. I just want to give a, at least a first set. Um, I think there's room for these playbooks to have a lot more moves in them. Um, and we haven't even gotten into transcendence moves, which is going to be a whole other thing. Hiring song 88. Um, the, the hard line between moves that interact with links is this one here. So when you're in your transcendent self, that's where your moves are going to require social links and spend them, which is like a whole aspect of the game that I haven't really gotten into yet. Um, I'm going to spend a session on trying to like hammer that out. Um, but weirdly, it's just like, I mean, you'd think it would be like a really core, like do it first kind of thing. But the more I'm fleshing out the game, the less I'm like, oh yeah, I really have to like do that. I'm just like, that, that can wait. That's pretty peripheral. Um, it doesn't feel like the core of the game. Um, if I were to use like a burning wheel comparison, you know, it feels like Duel of Wits and Fight in that, yes, it's really cool, but also it's used less often. <laughs> um, and I can kind of put it over here and figure out a lot of the like core of the game um, that it's going to interact with, but it, like the foundation essentially that I want to build first. So stuff like knowing about stress and darkest self, I actually feel is like more, um, more core, more critical to develop than this transcendent stuff. I feel like this is, um, this kind of, it can kind of angle off whichever way it's going to uh, attach itself to the, the core of the game. Um, And yeah, yeah, everyone's everyone's describing great kind of like thematic expressions of, of 
why this move that we want to do here exists. But in terms of like what mechanically it does, I'm not entirely sure how to write it. Do we want to make this that we get an extra die to gather information rolls about the darkness? Is it like, rather than, and the way you can look at this is like, cool, you can invest in increasing one of your stats, which is going to get you a better action roll, and you could use that action roll to gather info about any topic, but then if the way that you're gathering info doesn't jive with that roll, then it's not as helpful as maybe this move, which is about gathering info about a topic. And so anytime you're engaging with that topic and gathering info, regardless of what stat you're rolling, you always get at least one die. Um, right, which are similar ways to do it, right? Like it could just be like, you get an extra die to consort in blades, but like, that is applied very differently than you get an extra die to all gather information rolls. Even though you might consort to gather information, um, you know, they're they're each equally broad, but in in different like silos. Um, damn, hyena just doling out potency. You think I'm gonna give that to people for free? Get out of here! It's not happening. Yeah, like I know that I want to have this move, but I'm really not sure what this move would actually be. Because you could you could apply this in so many ways, right? Like, it could be that you're better at fighting the baddies, or it could be... And here's a question too, right? Like, how are these moves going to play into our XP triggers, right? Of like, does this let us do independent action, or does this align with aggression? Now I feel like letting us get more information, that's kind of in, in line with our idea of independent action, um, that we get access to. We interrogate the fiction in ways that the other characters can't and can therefore pursue things that the other characters wouldn't think to, right? Um, so like your rival is off doing something and you're like off on your own, but then you like appear next to them. This whole thing is kind of about that. Um, this one kind of ties into our idea of aggression. Um, any of the stuff around competition kind of connects to that. Um, and then this one in a way is about independent action as well. You're doing your own thing or like you are independently saving someone else's ass, right? Um, or we want to be able to be aggressive, do this thing before other people do. It's kind of There's kind of a selfishness to them. So I feel like a lot of these moves connect in with that core, right? With something that we have decided is core about this playbook, right? That we be about independent action and aggression. So now coming back to this, how does being a former henchwoman feed into that? Yes, if master the whole like rival thing functions similarly to the move about uh, the show being like someone having their leash, right? The, that there's like a thing that binds two characters together, um, and has a bunch of mechanics attached to it. Um, and I don't think that this is like, I don't want this to be like you're still friends with all the dark stuff, you know, like you call up, oh yeah, back when I was in section four of the henchman gang with Willie, I'll just, I'll call Willie. Willie will know some stuff. Hey, Willie, what's, what's the queen of darkness doing? What's the, what's the gem queen? Do okay, cool. Yeah. We're going to disrupt our plans. You want to come along? Hey, okay. Forget about it. Click. It's not like, we don't want to go, like, that would be, like, a, the sprawl move for this, right? would be like, oh, yeah, you, you can talk to henchmen people that you used to know. Or, like, if this were a burning wheel, it would be like, okay, yeah, you have the henchman life path. You can find henchmen. Um, but that's not fundamentally what our game is about, right? Um, social connections that matter are between us and our friends in inside the crew, right? That's that's really, really important to us. Yeah, like, you can't just text Zoysite. I mean, because she's, she's shady. She doesn't return my calls. 
It's fucking brutal. Right? We're not about that with this game. Um, so... Yeah, yeah, no, and I'm not, sorry, I'm not trying to, like, call people out and be like, your idea is shitty or whatever. I'm just trying to, like, this is me, like, hashing through these ideas, right? So we don't want to, we don't want to go in this direction of, like, that a lot of other PBTA games would, would do, of doing, like, a circle Z kind of thing or, like, generating contacts. We could go in the, like, which I think I saw someone suggest in chat, this idea of kind of, like, spouting lore, um like in dungeon world where it's just like oh my character like knows some stuff and i get to like say some stuff that i know or like make a role and you tell me some stuff that i know about this thing but the thing i don't like about that move is that it is not very in the spirit of like play to find out right because you're, you're not really playing you're just like finding out there's no it's not a very interesting way of exploring the stuff. We don't see it in action. We just like learn about it very, very flatly. Um, and it makes the MC be forced to like commit to things early, which isn't always very interesting. Um, it makes sense in Dungeon World because there are like established facts about things because there are like specific monsters or whatever. Because it's, it's in the like, you know, it's tilting towards the Dungeons and Dragons tradition. Um, yeah, do we get like an extra downtime action where we can investigate? Um, and is that by way of like flashbacks? Is this like, is the outsider the one character that has trauma? Um, I would say if it was categorically true that they were a defector, um, I think that would be a really cool move to put in um, where you can just say like, oh yeah, you have like flashbacks to when you were with the baddies and like all the bad stuff that happened or that they made you do or whatever right like cool totally rad um because our playbook needs to be a little more broad uh, unfortunately that's like not that's not cool we can't do that um i mean we could put in a move about it but uh, that creates some weirdness i don't really want it because then like anyone can take the move and anyone can take the move even if their established backstory isn't that and then we have to decide well, well the way the what whose memories are you remembering is this like some weird time travel thing what i mean there are ways to justify it but i just don't like putting people through that kind of like i don't know i feel like that makes us step out of the characters in a way that is not interesting um okay we can always come back to this we don't need to settle on this now but i think this is an important core move for the playbook and overall i feel really good about progress on this playbook today i need to figure out what this third stat in kudere is i gotta think on it it's fucking hard coming up with the actions I'm gonna I'm gonna shelf this for now, uh, and I'm gonna play some video games. If y'all want to keep hanging out with me while I play some video games, um, you're welcome to do so. I'm gonna cut the stream for a moment just for VOD's purposes, and then I'm gonna come back up with a different headline on it and all that stuff. Um, so if the channel suddenly goes offline in the next five minutes, you'll know why. Um, thank you all for coming and checking this out and for helping me figure stuff out. Um, it's like immensely helpful to have people to like bounce ideas off of and steal ideas off of. Thanks Kira for that really good prompt for the darkest self for outsider. That was super good. Um, and just like, yeah, y'all are great and very creative. You could probably design your own games if you were of a mind to do so. And I think perhaps you should, um, cause you know, the more monkeys on typewriters we have, the more likely we are to get a Shakespearean sonnet. I'm just saying. Um, if mysteriously you do not already follow me on Twitter but are somehow still here, uh, you should follow me on Twitter, Acme and Crow. Um, 
I also have all of the VODs for this up on YouTube, um, so you can check those out at my YouTube channel. I'm Commuting Crow on YouTube. You can find it, it's in my Twitter like profile description. You can just click a link. Um, and you can also give me money on Patreon if you are so inclined. Um, people who support me on Patreon get to like be in the credits of my game when I do finally release it. But mostly it's like I'm already doing 16 hours of programming a week for your enjoyment. And so you can like support me doing that there. What more do you want from me? God. Um, and then also if I ever one day publish this, you know, it will connect in with that. Um, anyways, yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming by. And I'll see you all again on Monday. Uh, there is no blades show this coming monday on else channel like there normally would be but i'm i'm sure i'm going to fill the time slot with something uh, either more of this or uh or like elf and i will do something maybe elf sean and i will do something um so keep an eye out there it'll either be more design stuff or we'll like do a one shot or something um yeah with the whole like affiliate thing coming out for twitch uh I might make a little push, see if I can get that set up. Um, I think that's, I mean, it would be, I feel like it's perfect and helpful for me, like people in my position. I know that there has been, it's been contentious and some folks, you know, don't agree with it, some of the changes, but I think it could help me. Um, and I'll make a bunch of noise about that if that does go down. Anyways, thanks for tuning in everyone and I'll catch you later.